I want to welcome you all to what is the counting this this morning. Um, is that this morning? The uh, 15th annual John W. Pope Lecture at NC State, uh, which is sponsored by uh, School of Public and International Affairs in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, the lecture is part of the Political, Economic, and Legal Foundations of Free Societies project that I. Uh, Professor Andrew Taylor in the Department of Political Science direct um, and previously co-directed with Professor Steve Margolis of the Department of Economics, he's now a Professor Emeritus there, and which has been supported by a generous grant from the John William Pope Foundation since 2004, so 2004, I worked it out, plus uh, 19 minus 4 is 15, and that's how I got to the 15th. <laughs> Um, in addition to the lecture, which is uh, a central feature of the, of the program annually, but not the only one, uh, the Free Societies Project uh, includes a student group called the Society for Politics, Economics and the Law, um, and Dr. Roy Gordato, the faculty advisor for SPELL is here. Uh, it includes uh, reading groups, support for instruction, inter support for internships, faculty, graduate, student, and undergraduate student research. Uh, that, that is uh, the, the, the uh, Free Societies Project um, that's sponsored by the Pope Foundation. This year's Pope Lecturer is um, a Mona Charon, who um, you all know, uh, possibly, if you're as old as I am. Um, I've been observing uh, Mona's work for about, uh, reading and observing her work for about 30 years now. Um, uh, she's been a um, syndicated columnist, an author, who has observed uh, American politics generally in the Washington scene, particularly for that, for that period of time. She's currently a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Uh, she's a graduate of Columbia University. She did her uh, law, law, uh, work in law school at the George Washington University. Um, she began her career in journalism at the National Review, where she served as an editorial assistant. Later, she became uh, First Lady Nancy Reagan's uh, speechwriter and worked as her associate director in the Office of Public Liaison. Later in her White House career, she worked in the Public Affairs Office and she worked closely crafting uh, President Reagan's communication strategy. Uh, in 1986, she joined the presidential campaign of then Congressman Jack Kemp uh, and launched her syndicated column the following year. It's featured in more than 150 newspapers and websites. She spent six years as a regular commentator on the Capital Gang. I don't know if any of you remember watching the Capital Gang. Uh, it, uh, and the Capital Gang Sunday. Um, and she's been a judge of the Pulitzer Prizes. She's the author of two bestsellers, uh, Useful Idiots in 2003, Do Gooders in 2005. Her newest book, which is related to the talk tonight, um, is called Sex Matters, and that was published last year in June. In 2010, Mona received the Eric uh, Brindell Award for Excellence in Opinion Journalism. She's currently co-host with Jay Nordlinger of the weekly podcast Need to Know, and is a frequent guest on NPR, CNN, and other public affairs programs. Uh, the title of Mona's talk tonight, as you can see, is Me Too, A, Wim a Women's Revolt. Please join me in welcoming Mona Chan. Thank you so much, Andy. It's uh, been a delightful visit uh, so far. And thank all of you for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, delighted to be given an opportunity to come to a part of your state. Um, that I've not visited before. We are from Virginia, so you get to be denoted in our family the second best state in the Union uh, because we vacationed in the Outer Banks and uh, spent happy hours here. <clears throat> now, um, when I came in yesterday, the people were buzzing about something. Something There's a game, it has a net and a ball, and people talk about it in March. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I gather that Congratulations are in order about defeating Harvard, and um, I will not mention this when I'm speaking at Harvard on April 19th. 
Uh, OK, so why did I write this book, uh, Sex Matters? Um, many reasons, but some of them have to do with people like you. I want people to be happy and to thrive. And I think that part of the reason we are not, in some ways, has to do with sex. So in 2017, a new movement swept over the United States and over the developed world. It began with revelations that Harvey Weinstein, a powerful Hollywood mogul, had used his position to harass many, many women. He also stands accused of rape. When the stories about him were just starting to circulate, actress Alyssa Milano tweeted, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, write Me Too as a reply to this tweet. Within days, thousands of women did just that. And a Pew Research survey found that the hashtag was retweeted more than 19 million times between October 2017 and September 30th, 2018. That isn't a scientific sample, and we don't know how each of those women was defining sexual harassment or even assault. But there is no doubt that Milano tapped into a vein of anger and exasperation. In 2019, the wave of accusations has begun to slow. But in the past 18 months, hundreds of men in politics, journalism, business, and academia have been publicly shamed. Many have lost their jobs, though one prominent offender's Twitter feed emanates from the Oval Office. In fits and starts, we've embarked on a serious effort to understand the problem and begin to address it. But while we agree, uh, on that much of the behavior that we've been seeing uh, in the last couple of years is reprehensible, we do not have a consensus about how we got here or what to do going forward. The dominant lesson that most thought leaders take away from the Me Too movement is that more feminism is the answer to bad male behavior. As Samantha B put it after revelations that New York State Attorney General Eric Schneiderman who was himself a prominent Me Too advocate, was an abuser of women, she said, you know who's a better advocate for women? Women. The future is female, or at least it better be, because I am done with this. Feminist Katha Pollitt's resolve is similar. I have no answers, quote, but here's what I'm going to do. Vote for women, support women, protect women, believe women, unquote. So the feminist interpretation of Me Too is that the problem is men. And this is consistent with the feminist response to the problem of sexual assault and rape on campuses. As they see it, and this has become conventional wisdom, we are suffering from toxic masculinity. Traditional masculinity, they say, is the source of the current plague of gross behavior. The website, for example, Feministing, suggested that gender violence doesn't exist without white supremacy such as racism, colonialism, Zionism, and militarism. Tamara Burke, one of the leaders of the Me Too movement, explained that this is a symptom of a larger systemic inequality. I'm just going to move this mic. I think it's popping a little. Um, that this is a, can you all still hear me? Yes? OK, thanks. Um, this is a symptom of a larger systemic inequality and a systemic pattern of exclusion for women and for people of color. But almost as soon as Me Too debuted on the national stage, there were dissents. Some described the, mov uh, the movement as a moral panic and worried that it had gone too far. A case in point was the response to an anonymous article that appeared in the website Babe. A young woman photographer described her terrible experience of a date with comedian Aziz Ansari. The woman, who adopted the pseudonym Grace, described meeting Ansari, flirting with him, and then going on a dinner date. She was unhappy with all of it, the fact that he didn't offer her white wine instead of red, the fact that he seemed keen for sex, the way they had sex, everything. In the cab ride home, she cried and tweeted that she hated men. He just wanted to get me drunk and F me, she wrote. 
Days later, after talking with her friends, she concluded that she had been the victim of sexual assault. Any number of feminist commentators lambasted Grace and the Babe website for publishing the piece. Many noted the unfairness of publishing such a piece anonymously. The Atlantic's Caitlin Flanagan said it was, a, it was 3,000 words of revenge porn. CNN anchor Ashley Banfield chastised Grace on air, objecting that she was chiseling away at a powerful movement. OK, so that's one area of confusion. Other women who also think of themselves as feminists, like the actress Catherine Deneuve, have signed public statements of concern that the Me Too movement will ultimately redound to the harm of women. Men, they think, will be afraid to mentor young women in the workplace and will recoil even from harmless flirtation for fear of putting a foot wrong on this most sensitive of subjects. My own view is that Me Too is a pent up howl of protest against the sexual revolution and the complete destruction of rules and mores regarding sex. The women who are stepping forward to object to being gawked at, catcalled, exposed to pornography, sexted against their wishes, groped, manhandled, and assaulted, may think of themselves as expressing feminist self-respect. But another way to look at it is that they are fed up with the anything goes culture that the sexual revolution has bequeathed. The reaction of feminist Jessica Valenti to the Aziz Ansari story captures this quite well. She wrote, quote, a lot of men will read that post about Aziz Ansari and see an everyday reasonable sexual interaction. But part of what women are saying right now is that what the culture considers normal, are, the normal sexual encounters are not working for us and are sometimes harmful. Anna Barr, an anti-rape activist, told the New York Magazine that rape culture is an attitude toward women in particular, but not even just to women, to treating all people as sexual objects, nothing more than an opportunity for sex. Feminists are clearly right that men, many men, are behaving badly. I would say that I part company from some of my friends on the right, on the conservative side of the spectrum, who dismiss concerns, for example, about campus rape as just hysteria. I think some of the statistics may be exaggerated, but I also think there is a real problem. The question is, how did we get here? What is often missed is that the feminist movement itself has something to answer for. It played a significant role in midwifing the sexual revolution. It's what I've called the feminist mistake. At the dawn of its second wave, feminists made a fateful choice to link the women's movement with the sexual revolution. It need not have happened that way. Without the imprimatur of feminists who claim to be speaking for women's best interests, the sexual revolution would have been just one more chapter in the long history of men seeking to get women to let their guards down. But feminism ratified the sexual revolution as pro-woman. Was it? Women could have had the law degrees and corner offices and seats in the US Senate without discarding the traditions of manners, courtship, sexual restraint, fidelity, and chivalry that had required centuries to develop and that served women's interests and needs. The second wave feminists, eager acolytes of the new left, signed on enthusiastically to the sexual revolution. Burning to upend the double standard regarding sex, they advised not just that women should behave like men, but that women should emulate the very worst men. When I was in college in the late 1970s, it was considered a victory for the sisterhood if a woman used a man for sex. High fives all around. The slogan of the time was, chaste makes waste. Feminists linked arms with progressives and libertines to heap scorn on virginity. The liberationists disdained modesty as a hang up, while the feminists dismissed it as a relic of the patriarchy. In The Female Eunuch, Germaine Greer declared, in the final analysis, women aren't really free until their libidos are recognized as separate entities. 
Betty Friedan, personally invited, Robert Rimmer, author of the absurd polyamory manifesto, The Harrod Experiment, which was a huge bestseller in its time, to become a member of the National Organization for Women. And the American Association of University Women sought his advice about the cultural construction of gender roles. Hugh Hefner donated to the now Legal Defense and Education Fund, supported the Equal Rights Amendment, and filed amicus brief to the, briefs to the Supreme Court in abortion cases. The second wave feminists weren't repelled by the playboy philosophy. They were keen to have women treat sex as mere recreation, and male libertines were delighted to have feminist support. The sexual revolutionaries promised that free sex would rid the human race of guilt, shame, jealousy, and inequality. Men and women would enjoy carnal pleasures equally, and the hated double standard would be discarded. But su stubborn human nature obtrudes into this supposed idyll. Even with freely available abortion, and even with the old double standard discarded, women still aren't just like men when it comes to sex. They are more easily hurt, both physically and psychologically. They are more often disappointed. They are more often disgusted. And they are more likely to have regrets. Few in our loose era recognize this, but sex is not sport. It's fun, obviously. But thousands of years of human history show that it is no joke. It taps some of our best emotions, love, tenderness, care, and also some of our worst, possessiveness, jealousy, and rage. When women are stalked and murdered, it is almost always an ex-lover who is to blame. The New Yorker ran a short story in 2017 called Cat People that went viral. It wasn't a modern love story, more like a modern sex story. It featured a woman who flirted with a man mostly by text messages. It featured a woman, um, sorry, when they finally go out on a date and have sex, she's repelled by the sight of him. But she goes through with the sex act anyway, a little nervous about what might happen if she refused. And then afterwards, everything is different. She wants to cut things off, but he persists in his text messages. Now it begins to feel a little creepy. He seems obsessed. Cat people went viral, I think, because it hit on many aspects of modern dating that are disturbing. And it was honest about how the sex act itself is not always just good, clean fun. That was a lie sold by Hugh Hefner and his many accomplices. Sex, as I mentioned, can draw out our darker natures, too. Maybe it's not something to be entered into lightly. The sexual revolution was a juvenile demand for instant gratification and no strings attached pleasure. But mature adults recognize that to be our best selves, we cannot treat the sexual urge as just a thirst to be slaked. It must be elevated and civilized to serve as the glue of romantic love, and it must be controlled, and yes, in some instances, repressed, lest it spin out of control and cause pain and heartache. It wasn't just the patriarchy that made women less interested in casual sex than men. It wasn't the patriarchy that made women more sensitive and more vulnerable. It was nature herself. As the poet Horace put it, you can drive, the Roman poet I should add, you can drive nature out with a pitchfork, but she will still hurry back. The scientific literature on sex differences is abundant, if often underappreciated. Women's brains, for example, are less compartmentalized than men's. They have superior senses of smell and touch. Men tend to be better at spatial relations and high-end math, while women excel more at language, psychological insight, and social connectedness. Men are better at reading maps, women at reading people. But in no realm are the sexes more differentiated than in matters of sex. Testosterone gives men a much stronger sex drive than women. They are more, men are more visually oriented, more easily aroused, and less discriminating than women. Women are more oriented toward relationships and commitment. 
their bodies secrete more oxytocin, the bonding hormone. And as evolutionary psychology would suggest, women need men to stick around and take care of them when they are pregnant and nursing babies. My book, Sex Matters, documents these studies and findings because I discovered when I was interviewing students that elementary facts about male-female differences are not common knowledge. But the deeper point is not scientific, it's moral. If we were trying to design a social system that would encourage objectification of other human beings, that would inhibit romance, and that would enable date rape, we could hardly have done better than hookup culture. 90% of unwanted sex, including rape, happens during hookups, and alcohol is involved in 76% of cases. As I don't have to tell this audience, there is an epidemic of accusations of sexual assault on college campuses. Universities have hired phalanxes of gender-based misconduct specialists and Title IX interpreters. Though the statistics on college sexual assault have been exaggerated, and while some percentage of the accusations seem to arise from regretted sex, the prevalence of such complaints, overwhelmingly lodged by women, is a signal that the sexual free-for-all has not turned out to be the egalitarian, lubricious utopia imagined in the 1970s. As several women confided to sociologist Lisa Wade, they had been raised to believe that they had inherited the right to express their sexuality from the women's movement of the 60s and 70s. The reality of the 21st century has proved disappointing. Quote, they don't feel like equals on the sexual playground, she wrote, more like jungle gyms. The sexual revolution and the hookup culture it incubated left good men unsure of how to behave and offered bad ones a golden opportunity for abuse and even rape. Though the feminists who tout it may not see it quite this way, the Me Too movement is a red flag pointing to women's unhappiness with the sexual revolution. So many of the young women I spoke to when writing my book told me that they would love to date, to flirt, and to form relationships with men, but instead find themselves forced to choose either hooking up or nothing. Many young men complain that it's a small subset of men who wind up getting most of the sex, and many of the men I spoke with were dissatisfied as well. They may find the easy sex more enjoyable than women do, but they too want and need true emotional intimacy and commitment. So back to the feminist explanation about toxic masculinity. You will often see the accusation that our culture indoctrinates men to become rapists. I dispute this. Our culture doesn't teach men to rape. If it did, we would have seen an increase in rapes over the past several decades. Instead, according to RAIN, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, rape and sexual assault have declined by 63% since 1993. But our culture doesn't teach men how to be gentlemen either. And though the term gentleman may seem antique, it deserves a revival. Though it came in for a great deal of criticism on the right, I thought the Gillette commercial was, a, was, on balance, a good step. It showed men being kind, men disapproving of loudish behavior by other men, and fathers teaching sons to control themselves. We need a great deal more of that to counteract the confusing messages boys and men have been receiving for decades. They've been told that men and women are completely alike, that women want the same things from love and sex that they do, and that the only relevant warning light is lack of consent. These messages have left women angry and men confused. Destructive ideas have joined with advanced technology to make war on human intimacy and trust. With a large assist from Hollywood and Silicon Valley, sex has been commodified and porn has been packaged for convenience. The iPhone has made casual hookups as easy as swipe left, swipe right, and the ideas that make such encounters commonplace were provided by the sexual revolution. So let's talk about this term toxic masculinity. Feminists do us no favors by framing social problems as battles in a sex war. 
Imagine the reaction if men called femininity noxious. In her moving memoir of infertility called Motherhood Deferred, feminist Ann Taylor Fleming looked back at the rage against men that had intoxicated her as a young woman and acknowledged some of the costs. For example, she gave up her own chance at motherhood by delaying attempting to get pregnant until she, it was too late. She came to see other losses as well. The enraged feminists had failed to recognize that women want and need men's protection. Quote, by not insisting right then on our own fragility, our inviolability, our femaleness, we, eager to be equal young women, went down that path. In the name of equality, we forfeited a certain protective kindness from men, courtesies that were a lot more fundamental than opening a door, and yet, in hindsight, not unlinked." Unquote. Let's be fair. Despite our debased culture, men still often demonstrate what used to be called the manly virtues. I'll give you an example. Aurora, Colorado. 2012, a lunatic opened fire at a movie theater. In the chaos and terror that unfolded that night, no fewer than four young men pushed their girlfriends to the floor and covered them with their own bodies. Three died, and a fourth took a bullet to the leg but survived. Similarly, when a gunman emerged from the restroom of a French train in 2015, Six armed men rushed and subdued him at the risk of their own lives. Sorry, six unarmed men rushed and subdued him at the risk of their own lives. Masculinity is not toxic. It is like human nature itself, capable of both greatness and depravity. The challenge of any good society is to take the raw material of masculinity and femininity and mold it. And it turns out, that fathers and mothers are key to this civilizing process. Teen girls whose fathers are active in their lives are less likely to have body image problems and more likely to stand up for themselves than those with absent fathers. Boys who grow up without fathers are far more likely to struggle in school, to be absent, and to get in trouble with the law than those raised by both parents. Fatherless boys are less ambitious and also less likely to attend college than their sisters who also grew up without dads. And the boys are also less likely to be employed as adults. Research shows us that young boys need their fathers in order to become their best selves. Fathers tend to roughhouse with sons. No one tells them to do this. In fact, as I can testify from my own family experience, mothers are often made a little nervous by it. But it turns out that the rough play helps boys learn critical skills in self-control. Fathers are also stricter disciplinarians for all their children, whereas mothers tend to be more understanding. Fathers encourage their children to stretch their wings, to take risks, and to stick up for themselves. And good fathers model for their sons how to love and respect a woman. Boys will always seek to be manly. It's in their natures. Feminists do men and women a disservice by scorning it. Boys raised by good dads will find manliness in marriage, responsibility, and self-control. Feminism should cherish those things. But if boys don't have good models of masculinity, they will turn to bad ones, like the repellent manosphere that's online. Now, of course, I know that this talk of mothers and fathers and husbands of wives is a little edgy in our era, but we need to grapple with it. Because as the Me Too movement is showing us, the lack of good socialization of men has become a society-wide problem. Some of that is our entertainment, including the scourge of pornography. Some of it is declining standard of civility in general. But a significant portion is the result of fathers being less involved in, the, in child rearing. In 2012, Katie Royfe, feminist and mother of two children by different fathers, condemned concerns about single motherhood. 
If there, quote, if there is anything that currently oppresses the children, it is the idea of the way families are supposed to be, unquote. Well, that's the feminist mantra. But alternative families only work for a tiny, wealthy minority. For most women, for children, and as we're coming to understand better with every passing year, men, the traditional family remains the gold standard. It should not be anti-feminist or anti-woman to recognize that men and women do need each other and that contrary to feminist theories, marriage is a key pillar of stability for both sexes and of course for children. Now let me quickly add that of course there are many people who are raised by single parents who turn out great. I am not talking about any particular child or any particular family. Uh, but the, the trends are unmistakable that large numbers of kids growing up without fathers presents real problems for our society. Everything is connected. When more boys are growing up without fathers, there are fewer young men who become the kind of adults women want to marry, educated, employed, non-drug abusing, and not involved with the criminal justice system. Marriage also tends to connect men to their communities. As one father put it to me, why do we coach Little League and attend parent teacher night? Because our wives tell us to. If marriage grounds men, the lack of it leaves them alienated and lonely. Some 22% of prime age men are not working and are not looking for work. Unmarried men are overrepresented in this group. By contrast, married men with only a high school diploma are much more likely to be employed than unmarried men with some college or an associate's degree. Diseases of despair, which are alcoholism, overdoses, and suicide, have been rising among white middle-class Americans, the very population that has witnessed a steep decline in family stability over the past several decades. Loneliness, another side effect, now exceeds obesity as a public health risk. Every year since 1972, the General Social Survey has asked a representative sample of American adults, how happy are you? In 1972, women reported being a bit happier than men. Each year since, despite the achievements of feminism, women's reported happiness has declined both in absolute terms and when compared with men's. Around 1990, the arrows passed each other. And since then, women have reported being less happy than men and less happy than their mothers or grandmothers were at the same stage of life. It wasn't just one survey either. Dozens of studies from Europe and America so show the same trends. At the same time, boys and men are falling behind women in many realms of life. Women now earn the majority of bachelors, masters, and PhDs in America. They are among the, uh, these are among the advances that feminists cheer. And that's fine, but perhaps we shouldn't be so quick to celebrate. The feminist movement has gotten us into the very bad habit of measuring the success of one sex at the expense of the other. Can women really be considered the winners if men are falling behind? Most women want and need upright, well-adjusted, dependable men to serve as co-anchors of happy and healthy families. Far from oppressing women, family offers a safe foundation for a full life. And fully engaged fathers help boys grow up to be gentlemen, treating women with respect. The Me Too movement is a healthy corrective to 50 years of sexual confusion. As I said, sex is not recreation. Without proper rest restraints, it can wound and degrade. Men are the more sexually aggressive gender and need the guidance of good fathers and others to learn to control themselves. The job of creating a culture of respect falls to men and women, and it will not succeed without a strong marriage ethic. Thank you very much, and I'll be glad to take your questions. Sort of say your first name and your student, what your major is, or something along those lines, and um, 
we'll take it from there. So, no question? Yes. So um, I think the lessons of social science in the last few years um, present challenges to same-sex couples. Um, and uh, one of the uh, one of my friends, who's a gay man married to a man, um, said that he had to look up like how women parent in order to try to emulate some of those things, in order to be in order to give their son both sides of the spectrum and what he needed. Um, friends of mine who are a lesbian couple have tried to include one of the brothers of one of the women in their son's life so that he'll have a, a male role model. Um, so it's a little bit more challenging when it's a same-sex couple, but it can be done if you're aware that it's important. Hi. Um, I'm a student, and my question was. Um, in, in more, in clothes, oh. and clothes, nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question was on. I think a lot of the frustration with women is the ideas of men not being held accountable for their actions. So you know, we've seen in terms of you know campus rape, men not being you know, facing jail time with rape kits not being, you know, looked through. Um, I think that is a big frustration. Where do you think this kind of falls into um, sort of your ideas um, on, I guess, like Me Too movement and that makes sense. <sighs> well, um, I hope that nothing I said gave the impression that I don't think men should be held accountable for bad behavior. I do think they should be. And I think that Me Too has been, on balance, a very good thing for our society because it's long overdue to call out this kind of behavior and make clear that it needs to be shamed and stopped. Um, regarding sexual assault, um, it's clear that there are many instances where um, if, there, if, if a rape happens, it should be treated by the criminal justice system. And women should be taken to a hospital so that a rape kit can be done. And it should not be handled by you know, a bunch of graduate students on a committee <laughs> at a college. Um, it should be in the hands of experts. So that's my view of that. Hello, I'm Will, I'm an engineering first year, hopefully going to aerospace. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded like we were putting some of the responsibility of the opiate crisis on single parents and uh, heterosexual relationships, or homosexual relationships. Uh, no. You were tying it to the uh, degradation of the nuclear family. Right, so that's different. Um, what, I was say what I was saying is that in the very same population that has seen a decline of marriage, and by the way, they've seen declines in lots of connections, not just marriage, but also church going, community organizations. There's a very famous book called Bowling Alone that came out a few years ago by Robert Putnam that described how um, people's community organizations are suffering so that they don't feel connected. And as I mentioned, loneliness is a severe problem. Um, the reason that I mentioned that it, I think it's also tied to family breakdown is that family breakdown, I, in my opinion, happens first. And then the churches begin to decline and the other communal organizations because the, the, uh, the first um, community is that of the family. And from that community, other communities are built out. And there's another aspect of this, which I didn't mention in my talk, but since you raised the question, it's a good time to mention it. Um, we have a very bifurcated society in America now. We have the upper third, which is the college-educated cohort in America, the upper third of the income spectrum, 
um, who live by one set of mores and rules, and the bottom two-thirds live by very different ones. Um, the college-educated cohort tend to um, live kind of like married couples did in the 1950s. It's not that different. They um, get educated, they get married, and they don't have children until they're married. The, I mean, it's, there are some who do, but it's 91% of college-educated people have children within marriage. They also have low rates of divorce. Um, that wasn't true for a little while in the 70s and 80s, but then it came way down. Okay. The other segments of our society, the middle third and the bottom, and particularly the bottom third, um, marriage is becoming, uh, it's, it's fading away. Um, you have more than 50% of women um, having babies without getting married. The U.S. has the dubious distinction of having the most unstable adult relationships in the world. Uh, we tend to get involved in relationships at a younger age, to have more turnover, more um, different partners over the course of our adult lives uh, than any, people, any other people in the developed world. And uh, this causes real problems. And uh, one of the things that I was saying in that section of the speech is that this uh, rise of um, opi opioid addiction, unemployment, um, sort of cra crashing communities is linked to the decline of marriage. And I will cite uh, the work by Angus uh, Dean and um, his wife at uh, Princeton, he's a Nobel Prize laureate, who, uh, who has studied these diseases of despair and the communities that they're hitting the hardest. And um, he's pointed to many possible causes, including the decline of manufacturing jobs and other things, but family decline is definitely part of that picture. And you don't see these diseases of despair among the upper third that's going to college and getting married and, and uh, so forth. Hello, my name is Danny Dolphin, and I'm a second year in women and gender studies. You have said that men are better at math and maths and that women were better at hearing and people. And I was wonder, I'm wondering what you thought about how this message was reflected, especially at a STEM engineering school, of what message that was sending to women. Well, so first of all, I said men so I, I would draw a distinction, okay, um, between what message are you sending and is it true, okay? So if something is true, it really doesn't matter what message it's sending. We should want to know about it, right? And even if it makes us uncomfortable, we should always want to know the truth and not run from it. So that's where I start. And based on all of the research that I did for my book, I came to the conclusion, which is not controversial in the sciences at all, that uh, in general, on a whole range of traits, uh, women tend to be clustered closer to the mean, that is, they have a taller and narrower bell curve, and men tend to have a shallower and wider bell curve. So there are more men at the very top and more men at the very bottom. It's the way nature seems to have designed things. This is true worldwide, it is in our culture, it's every culture. Now, maybe I'm wrong, and I could have the facts wrong, but to the best of my ability to interpret the data, that's a reality. And that's why I said that in general, and of course there are exceptions, so men tend to be better, tend to be better at high-end math. That doesn't mean there are no women who are good at high-end math, there are. It just, it's just a generality, and that's what I was saying. And women do tend to have a lot more psychological insight and have better social connectedness than men. It's one of the reasons that marriage between men and women is good for both, because they compensate for one another's weaknesses and strengths. Hi, my name is Jessica Lee. I'm a second year in women's studies. Um, I'm in the second year of women's studies. So, um, going off your answer to Will's question earlier, um, you had said that the lower two-thirds of the income brackets are tending to have this. So I'm wondering then, are you in the full support of free college tuition for all and free uh, safe and uh, secure abortion access and reproductive health for all women? <laughs> uh, no, I don't support those things. Um, Why? 
Well, um, free college is, a, um, is really a giveaway from the poor to the rich, right? Um, because most people in America don't go to college, even now, right? And so even if you made it free, you're making it free for people who really, most of them can afford it. So what you're saying is you're going to tax a waitress so that her boss's kids can get free tuition at college, because her kids aren't going. So how is that just or fair? Why do you think her children are not going well, Because mostly they don't. That is, that is the reality. Why are they not going Th That is a very long discussion. But the fact is, we still only have about one third of the country that, go, that completes college. More start, and then they drop out. But only about a third complete college. And if you want to change that, I'm all for it. I, I'm, I'm open to, uh, to, to suggestions. I've been a big booster of school choice programs. Uh, uh, I've been a big booster of, uh, of, of um, uh, charter schools, alternatives, because clearly what we're doing right now isn't working Which very well. System, Which is, anyway, we we're going to go down a rabbit hole here. But you said something else. Free college, and what was the other thing? What was the other thing? You said free college yeah, and, and um, you, you oh, abortion. Yes, yeah, yeah I, 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 I think abortion is killing, so I'm not going to be in favor of that. Talks seem to be very oh, generalizing on a mass scale, but then you're resorting to one personal belief on that. No, I have a view on abortion that isn't, it's not my personal preference, it's my evaluation of the morality of something. So, for example, I also think animal cruelty is, is bad and should not be permitted. Pardon? And because I'm against animal cruelty, I'm not just not going to beat up puppies myself, but I'm for arresting people who do it. So it's more than just a personal preference. OK. Next. <laughs> yes. Sort of the whole idea that uh, women are better at you know social um, professions and men are sort of better at math and math and all that kind of thing. Um, I think it's been talked about a lot in psychology, like the uh, controversiality, I guess, of um, talking about gender differences because it's like a well-researched concept that stereotype threat impacts people's performances. I think those studies are not true, but anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. And then another thing I was going to say is. Um, I don't want to like attack you on this, but I was just wondering because um, you said you were against abortion, but you know, a big part of your talk was sort of um, the institution of families and um, ensuring that someone has a healthy family and all that kind of thing. So if um, women aren't being given the right to uh, abort their child if they're not ready for it, if they don't have a safe, stable family environment, and with the state of the foster care system currently, I was just wondering, um, you know, how does that tie back to your your views on that? Okay, so. Um this seems to, there seems to be a lot of interest in this, so I will, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, the uh, stereotype threat, I think, has been way oversold. Um, I think that, for the most part, we have much more encouragement to women to go into STEM than discouragement in our society. I even know young women who've told me that they wanted to study psychology, but because they were really strong in math and science, they were being pushed into STEM fields that they actually didn't even want to go into. So there's that too. You know, there, there may be some people out there who feel that they're, they're not going to be welcomed in a STEM field because they're female, but there are probably just as many who feel like they're being pushed in that direction against their, better, uh, in, against their inclinations. OK. Um, and obviously, people should be free to do whatever their hearts desire when it comes to choosing a profession and so forth. Now, the topic of abortion, um, a lot of, look, we're not going to settle this. It's a matter, it's a deeply emotional and uh, uh, ethical decision that you have to grapple with, whether you think it's right to resort to killing. I think it's, it's profoundly immoral. Um, but one thing you said I will um, respond to, because th this is a common misconception. You said, considering what our foster care system is like. 
So there's a huge difference between the foster care system, which is mostly for children who have to be separated from their parents because of abuse or neglect, and or because their parents are in prison, and um, the adoption system. There are waiting lists of people in this country to adopt children. Anybody who wants to place a child for adoption can immediately find many families who are waiting, sometimes years, to adopt. There are even waiting lists for Down syndrome babies. There are people who would love to adopt Down syndrome babies. So the idea that the foster care system has something to do with abortion is not right. Well, um, there is never any reason for a man to think that he can sexually harass or abuse a woman, no matter what, under any circumstances. That much having been said, um, I actually think that our society, and now I know a lot of people in the room are not going to like this, but this is my view, um, and you can have your view. My view is that we have been... Um, engaging in a social experiment with women in combat. I'm all for women in the military. There are many jobs that women do in the military that are, you know, they're great at and they should do. Um, I'm, not, I'm not crazy about the idea of women in combat for a whole variety of reasons, including they, um, I don't like the idea that they are so vulnerable um, to the enemy in combat. I don't like the fact that the, they're male um, fellow soldiers will feel the need to protect them in a situation where that's not appropriate for the purposes of the military. And uh, I also don't like the image of um, mothers marching off to war. So I know that probably doesn't um, resonate with too many people in this room, but that's how I feel. And uh, a lot of women in the military actually feel that way too. They are very pro women in the military, not so much keen for combat. I'm uh, going to take the liberty of asking the last question. And it goes to this one of the questions up there was talking about the two thirds, or in response, we were talking about the two thirds, one third kind of division in American society, which is largely economic um, and tied to education. And it seems to me as though sort of the argument about the importance of marriage is conditional. Uh, it's more important for people in the two thirds, perhaps, than it is in the one third. Um, I've heard, you know, we, we, if we look at sort of uh, tradition, uh, developments with regards to marriage, in, in particularly in Western Europe, where there are high levels of law, the marriage is going down, um, and places like Scandinavia, uh, social outcomes remain very positive. Um, there's also research, and, and it's very new, I know, um, and was talking, still talking about small ends, but there's research about same-sex couples um, and, and positive impacts that they can have on children that they adopt. Um, but we're really talking about middle-class people when we talk about these effects. Um, so is that true? Is this, is this observation true that, the, that for whatever reason, because of education largely, and because of economic means, that that one third uh, has advantages, dis maybe personal discipline, social institutions, that uh, compensate for, maybe don't compensate for marriage, but at least 
provide some kind of structure that it married where marriage is uniquely important for that other group. Right. So, um, yes, excellent point. So the um, the top third, um, and of course, you know, there's individual variability, but the top third has everything. They come from intact families, you know, the, the young people, they come from intact families. They have mostly, you know, healthy communities. They have after school activities. They have tutoring. They have clubs. They have churches. Uh, the upper third are more likely to attend church than the bottom, uh, which surprises people a lot, but it's true. Um, and um, so they have all the things, all the building blocks, and money, of course, and all the connections that come from the fact that their parents are employed and, and, and have all those work connections and can help their kids get internships and jobs and all of that. So that's the upper third, and they are doing great. And part of what they have going for them is those intact families. But as you say, they have so many other things, too. Uh, the middle third has is more like the bottom third, not as much, um, but is weaker. And the bottom third, you know, they have nothing, or they have very few of the supports that help people to succeed. And so that's why it's, as you say, marriage is much more important in, if you're at the bottom of the economic scale than if you're in the middle or at the top, because you need that support and you need that partnership um, in order to help one another, you know, when uh, married couples are much less likely to lose a job because of illness, for example, uh, because if, um, if, like, when you have children and one parent uh, and a child gets sick and one parent has to, you know, stay home for a long period of time uh, to take care of the child, you're more likely to lose a job. If you have two parents, less likely to happen. You can divide uh, the, the responsibilities. There are a million things like that. Um, parents, uh, children who grow up with both parents are a lot safer. Um, you know, the chance of a child being killed uh, by a non-relative male who is living in the house with the child's mother, something I think is like 50 times higher than for a child living with both parents. Um, so. Se suggesting marriage as an important goal for, for people at the bottom end of the scale and those, some of those moving into the middle is not to disparage them. It's not to say, you're a bad person. You didn't get married. You're immoral. It's to say, you need some building blocks of security and, and help and, and cooperation. And guess what? You know, the family has done that. It has a track record. We know it works. And we've, we've left it behind at a very, very high cost. Well, thank you very much, Nona, and thank you. Uh, well, we're going to finish with, with this. I was just wondering, since you said that was the last question, I just want to ask you a question. Well, we're going to wrap it up. We're, 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 we're kind of done. Um, seven o'clock. Yes. What is the question? Yeah. That's okay. I come from a single parent household, so um, I, I don't I don't mean to criticize you anyway, but like, I'm, I respect you. But um, there, I find it like in my viewpoint, I find that that there's a societal myth going around that like because like I grew up in a single household that I'm kind of psychologically maladjusted and therefore I'd be less successful in society. But I, I find that, that because I grew up in a single parent household, my mom was forced to take on more, a lot more work than somebody in a traditional family. And therefore, most of my, uh, most of my household problems came from the fact that there were not two incomes and only one income. And therefore, I find the fact that um, people in my single parent households, people with myself, or less likely to become successful is because of economic reasons rather than the need to look up to a male role model, so to speak. Um, do you have any name? Will you tell us your name? Uh, my name is Gabe Perot, and I'm, I'm in first year engineering, and uh, I'll probably remain in chemical engineering. Well, good for you. Um, I couldn't have done chemical engineering if my life depended on it, so uh, good for you. I, um, 
look, as I said, I, many, many kids who are raised by single parents turn out just fine. But, um, and, and it's, it's really, really wrong to think, to look at any individual and say, oh, you know, you, you only grew up with one parent, you, you must be damaged. Of course, that's totally wrong. I'm talking about society-wide you know, population statistics that the chances of having problems are greater if you come from this kind of family. That's just reality. Okay. Um, and, um, and, you know, the thing you mentioned is one of the reasons that marriage is so recommended for people who want to have children, which is it's a lot easier to manage with two incomes than with one. And uh, it's a lot easier to manage with two with four hands instead of two, and there are a million ways in which uh, life is easier when it's two parents rather than just one. So all honor to your mother or your father, whoever raised you. Your mother, I think you said. Yeah, I mean, great. And, and, and she deserves full credit for raising a great son. But it is harder, and she shouldn't have had to do it all by herself. <laughs> OK, thank you, everybody, uh, for coming. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for, uh,